to church, friends. <laughs> Woo! That was good. I could listen to that all day. I told Renetta this morning that I was Zoom. tired and I didn't know that I could do a sermon and I said we could just sing. I think she took me seriously. <laughs> Anne Lamott is one of my favorite writers. I don't know that everybody here knows who she is, but let me tell you, she, that woman, is a prophet. She's a cranky one, but she's a prophet of the heart, of the soul, of the spirit. And she writes this, hope begins in the dark. The stubborn hope that if you just show up and try to do the right thing, the dawn will come. You wait and you watch and you work. You don't give up. Anybody here ever need that kind of hope? You know, you ever laid awake in bed at night at like 2 a.m. Do you know there are no good thoughts that come at 2 a.m.? There was a time in my life where I would lay awake at night and feel suffocating grief and depression. Just laid there night after night after night, unable to reach out for comfort or care to someone right beside me. I had had cancer, I'd lost two babies, and the night, my friends, was dark. It was dark, and I did not know where hope was. I did not know if I would ever feel hope again. I did not know if I would ever laugh again or find joy or remember what it was like to just walk through my day and feel normal and good. It was the hardest time of my life life. This morning, we learn about a prophet named Anna. Now, y'all might have guessed that I'm a little particularly attached to the prophet named Anna, but she brought hope with her. Mary and Joseph had had Jesus, and they were bringing him to the temple to be blessed to follow the laws of their church. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what was stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And in this temple, there was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. And at the moment she came, she began to praise God and to speak about the child to who all were looking for, for the redemption of Jerusalem. Let's think about that for a moment. This little old lady, can you see her in your mind's eye? Waiting, 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 84 long years, waiting, wondering, when is the Messiah going to come? Living in a hope, fasting and praying and waiting, and finally... 
the day comes. She sees this little babe in his mother's arms. She reaches for him. She blesses him. She cries tears of joy for him because finally she saw him. Anna did not just see some cute little baby, though. She saw Jesus. She saw the Messiah. She saw the one who she had been waiting her entire life for. Who sees you? Who sees you for who you really are? Not the mask that you put on sometimes. Not the pretense that you wear like a coat to protect yourself from people seeing who you really are, how you really feel. To keep people from seeing your woundedness or your brokenness, your hurt, your pain, your depression. Who sees who you really are? As a faith community, who do we need to see? The church historically has done a pretty crummy job of seeing people. The church encourages people to come through the front door of whatever building it's in and put on a mask of happiness and joy as if we have to pretend to be whole and healed. And maybe you are in a good place right now. But the church does a pretty poor job overall of allowing us to just be present as we are. So how as a church can we see people as they really are? The thing with Anna is that through seeing Jesus, who he really was, By acknowledging him as who he really was, what she was doing was bringing hope. She is a prophet of hope. Folks needed hope at that time. Now, this is a story that takes place when Jesus was a baby, but it was written decades, decades after that. Rome had come in and destroyed Jerusalem, had destroyed the temple. It was rubble all around them. And so the people that were reading and hearing this story in the first century, they needed hope. Think of us after 9-11. What did we need? We needed hope. It's the same thing. You know, hope, hope is a funny thing, isn't it? Like, it is so delicate. Hope is so delicate that we think and we can be afraid that it's just going to snap at any moment and break and that we're going to lose it. And yet hope is strong enough to carry us for as long and as far as we need it. And yet Anne Lamont also suggests that hope is confusing Hope is confusing because she says on one hand there is hopelessness of people living in grinding poverty. And on the other, we pour money and time and organizations that feed and mentor people. We show up in refuge key camps with water and art supplies and, and people all over the world teach little girls auto repair and electrical installation and teach boys how to care and nurture for babies. Witnessing all of this, she says, fills me bursting with hope. And isn't that the truth? Because there is so much wrong with this world. There is so much hopelessness, so much brokenness. Children are abused. Elderly go hungry. There is heartbreak and grief. There is war. There's poverty. There is more wrong 
with this world than any of us can fix in 10 lifetimes. And it can be downright discouraging. We can wonder where hope is. If you're not sure where hope is this morning, where do you need to see hope? How can we as a faith community help carry that hope for you and with you? Because the thing is, we need hope like we need air to breathe. And if faith communities are not for bringing and carrying hope for one another, then I'm not even sure why we're here. Anne also says that hope is ultimately about love. She said that we have been redeemed and saved by love. Love is why we have hope. But even more than that, the love of God is why we have hope. Anna, Anna saw love when she looked at that baby. She saw and she knew who that baby was. She saw his importance and the love and the hope that he brought into the world and how he would change the world. And that love in that moment changed her. It changed her for somebody who was waiting and praying and fasting. It changed her into somebody who had experienced finally all that she had hoped for, all that she had anticipated, all that she needed in her life. That hope was fulfilled in that moment, and it changed her. And you know what? That same love, it changes you, and it changes me. Because it is a hope based on love. It is a sustainable hope. It is real, and it is tangible. That kind of love feeds our hope. It gives us the hope that we need. It makes it real and not false. The love of God for us, for you. Your love for God is the same. It is tangible. It is real. And that love feeds hope. That love feeds people at Micah. That love volunteers at kids' schools. That love provides time and money for people who are hurting and who are broken and who are experiencing hopelessness. That kind of love is why Shawnee Community Christian Church exists. That kind of love changes us, and it should. How are you allowing the love of God to change you today so that you can be a holder of hope for a world that so desperately needs it? Amen. This morning, let us pray together. God, we come to you in this place, in this time, when so much has gone wrong, when there's so much in the world that breaks our heart, when we're just not sure sometimes where to find hope, when hopelessness can overwhelm us. God, it's a world where people simply go to the store and they experience gun violence in the worst day of their life. It's a world where people wake up in the morning and yesterday there was peace and today there is war. It's a world, God, where children wonder where their next meal is going to come from and parents wonder where their kids are going to sleep that night. It can be scary and overwhelming and heartbreaking. And we don't have all of the answers, God, and we want to fix it. And we can't always do that. 
but we know that you are present with us, that you will lead us and that you will guide us and that you will provide us with a way to do what we can in the moment that we're in so that we can help hold hope for somebody who feels hopeless. God, we lift up that hope this morning for people who are ill, people that we know and love, people who are afraid, people that just aren't sure what to do next. God, we stand here before you and lift up hope for them. In your name we pray. Amen.